You must be Kurt. All right, I want to meet you, Kurt. Okay, so I'll start with Kurt here. Kurt's kind of in my shoes. I've been doing it for 25 years, and and I don't know how long Kurt's been. For several years, he's been kind of the a go-to guy when you get busted here in Seattle, and he's evolved that practice. I haven't been able to. I'm from Ohio, you understand, and uh, and uh, I'm Donnie Workshop, just sorry, and. Uh, uh, you know, I don't get to help dispensaries in these uh, fledging efforts, but Kurt's kind of here on the front line in Seattle representing these guys who are pushing the edge, trying to come up with good models for how we're going to dispense and how, how we're going to make the whole issue of cannabis go away as an issue and become kind of uh, uh, the uh, panacea that it deserves to be. You know, it really is the panacea. So. Excuse me, I have to give a hug. Steve D'Angelo here is the hemp baron of Oakland, California. He decided with his friends that they wanted to start a club that was a model for how to do it. And so they took an old, almost bank building and took it over and built it into more of a bank in a building. And uh, and um, I think there's seven places, seven counters to uh, actually get serviced after you've seen everything and know what you want. And, and it, it, they do an amazing business there and, and nobody's upset. And in fact, if it were a problem, the city of Oakland wouldn't be opening it up for more of these clubs to open up. So, um, you know, uh, Stevie really gets our Thanks for being the role model here, okay? And, and James Anthony, also from Oakland, uh, former city prosecutor, and, um, and you know, like all around great guy, um, is uh, kept a specialist in how to get along with cities, and, and that's what these clubs really have to do. And he's been through a lot of wars over this already, and it's not over, there's a lot of wars to come. So, uh, thank you for coming all the way from Oakland, guys. Okay, and then we got our own John Davis. You know, and John Davis is one of these miracle team that has taken Hempfest from a small little community event into this colossus that we've become. And, uh, and, um, and so we really owe his organizational skills and his communication skills a lot here. You know, the, the fact this place is so awesome is in part due to John Davis and all the people working with him, you know, that have, wow. You know, uh, this, the, you have the, hold on everybody, the best is yet to come. And uh, Doug McVay, okay. And, and Doug, um, you're a great moderator. Would you kind of take care of over the stand since there's five of you, everybody showed up, I don't get a chair. So you're kind of the chair of this meeting here. And. Uh, the, um, CSDP, Common Sense for Drug Policy, CSDP.org, uh, uh, has been a, a stalwart supporter of sensible policies in, in drugs. And from all of the ads they've put into all the magazines around, uh, you know, all kinds of different issues, they've, they've uh, tried to explain what's going on in really sensible ways and drug war facts and uh, you know we're all got to support drug war facts it's really kind of a, a wiki of, of what you need to know to you know um, go back to the actual statistics of anything in the drug war put on by CSDP so uh, thank you Doug um, I'll let you guys go in whatever order you want to speak in starting with uh, let's see who's the oldest in this thing I think Stevie gets this honor you know, we start with this end and um, tell your stories and um, uh, stay tuned. Thank you. You got an hour. Oh, we got an hour. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot right now because what I found uh, in, in this kind of intimate group, and if 
folks there in the back maybe want to come a, a little bit more up front uh, so we can sort of see each other a little bit more. Uh, I find that uh, doing some question and answer is really a lot of fun and uh, it's usually more effective at getting the information uh, from us to you that you really want and really need. So. Well, uh, that's what my job as a moderator is. I get to be Donnie Yu, down in the crowd doing the um, oh, okay, lecture sure. when we get to that. So, <laughs> All right, well, um, it, the truth is I didn't really have an opening statement prepared. So uh, just very briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, myself. I've been an activist and an entrepreneur my entire life since I was about 15 years old. Most of that time I spent on the East Coast in Washington, D.C., in 1998, we passed an initiative in Washington, D.C., Initiative 59, with uh, about 69% of the vote. It was a mirror image with a, a little bit uh, on steroids of California's Prop 215, which passed in 1996. Uh, even though we won overwhelmingly in the city of Washington, D.C., the U.S. Congress is the ultimate holder of power, and they refused to allow us to implement that law. Uh, that really, of course, disillusioned me, made me really angry, uh, to the point where I didn't feel like I could even stay in Washington anymore. Uh, at the same time, I was looking across the country and seeing in California that the law that was passed in 1996 was beginning to be implemented, and I was interested in being a part of that movement. So I arrived, uh, I decided to come to, to California. I arrived in California about 2001, and when I got to California, there were basically two types of medical cannabis dispensaries. The first were those that had been started by well-meaning activists. Um, they were long on good intentions, uh, but very short on business experience or startup capital. And the facilities they put together reflected that background. Uh, they, if you were lucky, it felt like going to somebody's living room. If you were unlucky, it sort of felt like going to a soup kitchen. Uh, often people hired their friends, didn't train them very well, didn't really put in cash registers or build the properties out or do any of the things that you would expect from a normal retail store experience in the United States. Now, despite that, they were very, very successful uh, because patients had no other alternatives and they began doing millions of dollars a year, many of them. That in turn attracted a second wave of dispensary operators uh, I call them the thug operators, people who were really uh, mostly interested in making as much money as they could, as quickly as they could, often had background in other kinds of illicit gray market commerce like pornography or gambling or other types of drug dealing. And the facilities they put together reflected that background, um, often bristling with barbed wire and bulletproof glass and big thugs who expected patients to line up and choose their medicine quickly for a minimum of questions and, and get out and leave their money. So for me, uh, as a patient, as an activist, as an entrepreneur, uh, that both of those models were inadequate. And I resolved to put together a model of cannabis distribution that would focus on wellness, that would bring together the highest ideals of activism and professionalism. I was able to implement that vision in 2006 at Harborside Health Center, uh, and five years later, we have been mostly successful at doing uh, what I hoped to do, which was create a model of cannabis distribution that demonstrates to our fellow citizens that cannabis can be distributed in a way that brings benefits to communities and not harms, uh, which I view as the main mission uh, facing the cannabis industry and for that matter, the cannabis reform movement. So uh, thanks for listening to me and uh, look forward to answering your questions. Uh, my name is Kurt Vail. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I focus on uh, marijuana offenses, medical marijuana offenses. I also represent a number of uh, marijuana, medical marijuana businesses in the uh, King County, Western Washington area. Um, it's funny that you were talking about business models because in Washington, we're just still developing what business model we can operate under. Um, we had a lot of hope in Senate Bill 5073. The medical marijuana community had a lot of hope in Senate Bill 5073 as it passed through the Senate and the House. 
uh, and it was ultimately vetoed by Governor Greg Warren for some unrealistic fear of federal prosecution of state employees. Um, so that left us with small portions of Senate Bill 5073 uh, that we could operate with. And when the governor vetoed SB 5073, uh, my clients, my uh, my cannabis industry clients, asked me to reach out to the city of Seattle. The ones that were located in Seattle asked me to reach out to the city of Seattle and see if we could work on some sort of guidelines so that there could be uh, some sort of regulation in this industry. And, and Seattle was a willing participant. Uh, uh, city Councilman Nick Licata, Pete Holmes, all uh, were, were willing to work with the community here to develop some sort of guidelines, some sort of framework that would assure uh, not only safer communities, but would assure that the 25,000 plus medical patients in Seattle would continue to have access to their medicine. So what, what we've come up with essentially is a framework uh, of uh, city guidelines, city codes, just that any other, any other legitimate business would have to uh, uh, operate by. Um, we're limited by 5073 as to what we could call ourselves. Before, uh, people were operating as a dispensary uh, because they could, they could uh, serve one patient at any one time. Um, at post 5073, uh, a patient, a designated provider can only care for one patient every 15 days. So where does that leave the access points? Or where does that leave the, the uh, uh, dispensaries? Uh, what, what they're doing is they're forming or changing their business model to become an access point for a collective garden. And uh, Collective Garden is specifically addressed in Senate Bill 5073. Uh, ten patients can be members of 50 uh, can be members of a Collective Garden uh, with up to 45 plants. Now, there's no indication of how long those ten patients are required to be members. So, what's happening is, as long as there are three members of the garden at all times to cover the 45 plants, uh, these access points can rotate patients through the gardens. They have to keep very specific books, uh, but they can they can rotate patients through specific Collective Gardens. And that seems to be uh, acceptable to not only Dan Satterberg, but to Pete Holmes as well. And uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of the other, uh, the other communities, uh, Shoreline, uh, that, are, that are following Seattle's lead, that are creating, they're lifting their moratoriums or they're, they're amending their moratoriums to allow uh, access points to some degree. So um, we're moving forward slowly, not as quickly as we would like to, but uh, we are moving forward in a positive direction. So we have great hope for next year too. Good afternoon. I am Doug McVeigh. Currently, I'm working in Portland, Oregon, uh, developing a patient resource center for a nonprofit called Voter Power. We don't have yet uh, in uh, in Oregon. We don't have legal dispensaries. Um, twice so far, by the initiative process, we've tried. Twice, it's failed. Another attempt is about to be launched. In fact, it's being launched. The Oregon Marijuana Policy Initiative, OMPI Campaign 2012.org. Um, we'll be uh, sponsoring two different initiatives this uh, this uh, this cycle. One for a uh, one for dispensaries and another for full decriminalization. Um, I think you're in Oregon with four initiatives so far, and more probably on the way. Um, it's interesting to watch because there are two different ideas about success. One is to watch what's organically developed in a place like California with a great deal of broad latitude, a successful business. And the other is the limited parameters that we're working within in some of these other states where success really means what can we sell to the politicians? What can we get by with? Um, in Oregon, of course, we're going to have hopefully the chance to see what's going to happen. As it is, uh, we have limited ability to get reimbursements. Uh, based upon money spent for rent, money spent for electricity, fertilizer, dirt, etc. But the actual time, labor of these uh, of these garden, these growers or registered uh, growers or caregivers may not be compensated, and so there's a great deal, very strong limitation there. Others of us are working on a donation sort of a um, sort of a model where people make donations and they're enabled as a result to pick up some of the excess from patient gardens. Very difficult, very difficult frankly, and yet we have uh, 50 or so people coming through my PRC every day. Um, so it can